Hello everyone, it's Neil here from 3D Tutor, back today with another guide. And this one has a bit of a different workflow, but what an amazing result from about five hours of work. Now we release between one and two complete guides every week. So I know everyone says this, but please like and hit that bell to be notified when we have our next guide out. This week is a Game of Thrones inspired asset. And next week, we're thinking of something from the new Overwatch 2. And that's all I'm going to say at the moment on that one. Now, if you want to get your hands on this complete blender build, complete with all the geometry nodes and everything you see in this scene, then the links, of course, are down below. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. Yep, 3D Tutor. That's us, because we're not big enough to get some big sponsor to come along and support our work. But we do have something better than that, and that is our Patreon, where you'll find every guide we have ever done, complete with all the blend files, materials, and textures. Now this is pretty standard across most Patreons you may see out there. But here at 3D Tutor, we want to do something a little bit different. In other words, we want to give you a whole lot more. This is because the more Patrons we get, the more free stuff we can keep creating. In fact, if we get to around 150 Patrons, we can hire another Pro Blender or Unreal Expert to pump out even more quality content. And of course, free stuff on top of that. So what do we give here at 3D Tutor via our Patreon? Well, over 350 hours of complete courses. Every month, you'll get to choose a course and it will be delivered right to your email. And best of all, you can pick which course you would like out of our vast library of over 23 courses. And the courses aren't just on Blender. We have courses on Unreal Engine, Photoshop, ZBrush, and for sure you're gonna find some Substance Paint courses in there as well. So please check us out over on our Patreon, links are down below. So now enough of all that, what you're here for is to see how we put together this Viking inspired boat. So let's get started on our Blender 3 stylized Viking boat. Cheers, everyone. So here we are in Blender 3.2, I think, and we have got a thunderstorm in the background, so I'm sorry about that. I can't do a lot about that. And the first thing I do to get this boat is I bring in a cylinder. And the reason I bring in a cylinder is it's going to make it very, very easy once I've added edge loops to actually get the right shape. Now, all you're looking for here is either a realistic or stylized shape. Just use proportional editing and bring in the actual um, edge loops and things like that. And then once you're happy with the shape, just play around with it a bit more. As you can see there, I'm just pulling up the front. And then as far as the shape's um, concerned, I'm actually done with it. And that's how I actually approach this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split my uh, boat straight down the middle. And the reason I'm doing that is because then I only have to mess around with one side. I can mirror the other side and it just makes it very, very easy. So that's why I've got that there, as you can see. Now, the thing is, I'm bringing in mark seams there, as you can see. And the reason I'm doing that is because now I'm working out where my actual planks are going to go. It's important with this actual build because it's very, very heavily stylized that we have the planks follow in a certain way. You can see them sloping down really, really nicely through there. The other thing is I also did that because I want that kind of um, big bulky bit on the top of them and then the planks to actually follow underneath. Now the big bulky bit, we're just going to paint that so we didn't bother splitting that. But you can see now the way that I split the planks is to mark seams, grab each faces, split them away from the other faces and then solidify them and finally give them a bevel. And there you go. Then you've got your actual planks. Really, really easy technique is exactly what I did with the top. Now with the top, I did mess up a bit because you can see on each of those ends that we've got faces and there's few end ons in there and things like that. So I do come back a little bit later actually to fix that. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create the actual mast. And the reason I'm doing that now is because it gives me an idea of scale. I've got my little, little guy over there, as you can see. I'm also going to Boolean that because it adds a little bit more realism um, in terms of you know it looking a little bit better, not so much um, realistic is what I'm talking about because it is stylized after all. And this you know really wouldn't be a good boat in real life. Next of all, I'm using a curve. And what I've done with that curve is I've actually extruded it out with the curve options and then I've used a solidify and finally I've uh, shaded flat and that gives me then a really, really nice view of how that curve is going to, you know, go around the actual boat. And the reason I'm using curves as well is because with a curve, when you bring it round, we can actually see and twist it really, really easily, much easier than actually making it, you know, with just a cube and extruding it or something like that. So last of all, before I finish this bit, is I'm just making it all fit together. You can see because we've got that really steep angle that obviously those top planks aren't going to go in properly. So 
So now you can see once that's out of the way, I'm just doing the final finishing touches on that just to get everything fixed. You can see that these are still a long way out. So I'm going to actually come in, fix them up, make sure they're working okay, and then actually um, bring them out. You can see what happened there was they were two, um, again, stuck together. So I'm basically just going and fixing every all of the issues that I have with that top part of it. We don't want the edges to be like miles away from you know the sides of the insides of the actual boat so we want them to be quite close we still want to have that plank look we could have done that with textures but we decided to make it a little bit more you know realistic uh, looking with the textures so you can see there what i'm talking about is with the curve you can see i brought that around i got hold of one of the uh, little um, vertices and pressed alt s and then you can see that it made it really really easy to bring it in kind of shrink it in and you can see because it is a curve as well, just how easy it is to play around with it, move it up and down and things like that. So now what I'm doing is I'm getting the actual head of the actual, uh, you know, um, dragon on the front of it, setting it all up. Again, I'm not worried too much about that because I know once I've got the dragon head in place, um, it will actually make it very, very easy then to actually build around that. The one thing I'm doing though is I'm going to bring these in because I do want to a kind of ornament on the actual sides of them. So I'm going to bring that in and mark a seam and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude that in like so. And now I'm going to put just a little bit of detail work in there. Now when I first did this I was going to use my uh, curve pen, to, um, you know the grease pencil to actually create this. But I found I didn't really have enough control over it as you can see. So I was going to do it that way. But in the end, I just opted to use the actual knife tool and that made it really easy. So you can see I'm trying again to use this uh, grease pencil, really not working for me. So what I did is I just uh, duplicated it, brought it out, got rid of one, and I'm just going to go in with the knife tool. And you can see just how much more control I've actually got now. So that's another way of approaching this. And then all you're going to do is you're just going to bring those out, extrude them, and then just solidify them. And there you go, you've got your actual detail work on there, which looks really, really nice actually. Round them off a little bit because I knew that they would be rounded. I mean, these things are all carved in, so just take that into account whenever you're creating something like this. Uh, same with the dragon head. You'll see the way I created that. I needed it to look as though someone's actually carved that in, you know, and uh, lots of hard edges looking like actual uh, wood. So again, with this, you can see it's not too round. It's not like metalwork or anything like that. It has been carved in with wood. All right, so now moving on to the actual head. And all I want to do here is just create a very, very basic head. Now, I was going to go with a cube, but I decided it's going to be so basic that I might as well just, again, use a knife tool, just cut out a really, really rudimentary head. Now, the thing is, when you're doing this, it's hard to see where this is going to go, and it looks so, like, silly like that. But once you've actually got it set up and you start bringing it in ZBrush, it really starts coming together, and that's the thing I would suggest. Sometimes you're just going to give up because you think, oh, that looks uh, really stupid. Well, and you can see here, it does. It does look stupid, but, you know, once we've actually got into the actual sculpting part and start to, to work on it a little bit. So what I would say is just make the head like I've just done and then just work, just keep working at it. Just keep going down on it. And if you have to restart it, then you'll have to restart it. But generally, once you've got it here and you're actually sculpting, um, you shouldn't really, you should be able to create something really nice, actually. Uh, the other thing is as well, you could sculpt this, of course, in Blender. I'm using ZBrush just because I'm a lot more familiar with the actual brushes in ZBrush and I actually find it much, much easier to use. You know, everything's set up for me in ZBrush, but you could definitely do this um, in Blender. The same goes for the retopology as well. Although I use Topogon, as you'll see in a bit, you could actually do this no problem at all in uh, Blender. And the reason I use Topogon is honestly the speed the workflow I have in that program is really, really fast because I just know the program so well. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I've basically got the general shape. Now you can see a lot of this shape, it's not very hard edged. It looks very organic looking and that's something that we really don't want to do. So what I tend to do is um, I'll take it into Topogon, I'll retopologize it. And the main thing I'm going to focus on is the line. So you can see I'm just accentuating where the actual creases are going to be. That's the main thing that you should focus on if you're going to do it uh, the way that I'm actually doing it. Don't worry about anything else, just focus on those lines. So here we are in Topogon, and I'll bring it in. 
this is a paid uh, program as well i mean but there are many many good options now like you know blender has its own topology things like that now you can see in this i'm not actually worried about the topology all i'm thinking about is getting those lines where are the creases actually going to be because I know that I'm going to use the Z uh, remodeler just to retopologize it anyway. And as long as I've got those really, really nice straight lines in, that's all I'm going for. Now, the thing is, you don't even have to worry about how straight those lines are really. Because once you've creased them and then you subdivide in, a lot of the work is going to be done for you, as you'll see. But you can see that where those lines are going, that's basically near enough, most of them, where my actual crease is going to go. And that then will give me this really, really hard edge um like you, you know like it would be wood now you can do this uh, in zbrush you can do it with a z remodeler but you've still got to go around and actually mark in wherever you want all of those hard edges to be so for me actually i find it this this way a lot easier and a lot of people are going to disagree and say well you know it's easier to do it this way but this is the way that i find it the easiest so maybe it is a bit uh, cumbersome you know using uh, another piece of software or something like that but as i say for me it's just the easier way to do it especially with the really, really hard edges. If I was doing something like a marine or something like that, they don't actually have to be, you can get away with a lot more, but if it's something like a wooden carving or something, yeah, this is the way that I would do it. Again, now you can see where I just actually brought that in just to make it easy then to join all those up. I know that's basically flat that part, so I don't need to worry about it. And you'll really see the magic actually happen once we have this back in ZBrush and we start actually um, creasing and bringing it all together. Now, the other thing is you, you're building this up, so just take that into account. When you first do it, don't worry if it doesn't look that great in the beginning because you're going to add to it anyway. So that's the other thing. You need to break this down actually into parts. So you can see there, I've only literally done the head. I haven't done any horns or anything like that. Now, I'm using the uh, Z modeler there, and you can see I'm going in now. I've got mirror on. I'm actually going in and marking actual creases uh, with poly loop basically on. And to get that on, you press the modeler, you go against a edge, you press space bar, and then you build self creases. And that's the way I do it. And now you can see we've got those really, really sharp edges, like as though it's been carved. And you can see it's completely different now from being an organic shape. And that's what we're actually looking for. So really, really easy. You can see what I'm doing is I'm um, uh, uh, subdividing it, and then I'm going back and just seeing where it looks like, and then adding more creases, subdividing it, and there we go till I'm really happy with it. And you can see just how nice that actually looks. All right, so now we should be going back to Blender. You can see I've polygrouped it now, and what I'm doing is I'm actually uh, um, using uh, Dynamesh just to give it a nicer topology. And you can see now all that topology that we did in top top of gone didn't matter, didn't do anything. And you can see now that all that topology is really, really nice. And that's why I didn't worry about it, because I knew it would do that work. Now, of course, um, you're always going to have some issues when you work like this because you're not retopologizing it yourself so when you have these issues it's important that you go in and you fix things and you can see there we've got a problem with the uh, with the nose part i've also mirrored it then so that if i do have any problems and come in and fix them and now what i'm doing is i'm adding sharps along those lines that i've already done just to accentuate those out more because i have you know shaded smooth and then brought on the normal um shading on blender I did get, I think I got rid of my mirror a little bit early and that's why I'm going to go in and do both sides actually. So messed up a little bit. So now we're adding on to the actual dragon and this, this, like I said, at the moment, the dragon looks okay in that, but once you start really adding things to it and building on what you've got, then you'll see it really come to life. So you can see that I'm using a curve for its horns. And obviously the reason is because I can twist them, move them wherever I want. And I can also make the ends of, of those horns you know, very much smaller by just pressing it all test, bringing them down. I'm adding a little bit of metal work now onto the horns. And now we're going to work on the next horns. So we're building, building, building on this dragon head until we've got something that looks really complex. And when you look at it to begin with, you're like, how did they create that? Well, this is the way that we did. And you can see that we started from a really, really simple actual shape. All right, so once we've actually done this as well, we're just going to keep building on this dragon head, putting in loads of bumps, loads of carvings, things like that, until we're actually happy with it. Now, if you was doing um, something, you know, more realism, for instance, it, this is also the way to go, but you're just going to have to add a lot more, probably in ZBrush, you know, a lot more uh, details and things like that, because it is stylized. 
we are able to get away with a little bit more, I think. So now I'm just playing with the uh, back of it, wondering like how it's uh, gonna all come together. Because obviously I had some references, but this is, you know, made from, you know, my own imagination. Um, we don't actually have a concept artist or anything like that. So we're, we're kind of building on the fly and seeing what looks good and what doesn't look good. So now the thing is I need to make sure that the back of the dragon fits with uh, what we've already created. You can see there, I've got some issues with my shops as well. So I'm just trying to, um, you know, fix all those things. And then finally, I'm just pulling out these parts now. You can see when I first pulled those out, they didn't come out properly. So all I did was I press shift D, duplicate them, brought them out, and then use a solidify. And that gets them really, really nice and smooth. All right, and after this, we're gonna be on to the actual teeth just to finish this off. Oh, the mouth first, then the teeth. Again, so it looks nice and carved now. And now we're on to the teeth, which again, you want to look really nice and carved. You don't want them to look, um, you know, like they're just made of metal or something because, well, that's the intention anyway. I wanted everything to look as though it's actually been carved out of wood, so. You can see as well, it's a really good way, you know, with a cube, subdivision, extrude the top of it, and then what you'll have is, a, you know, make the top of it smaller then, and then you've basically got a perfect tube, which if you need teeth, you can basically then take it into a ZBrush and you've already got your teeth there, uh, looking really nice. All right, a bit more work then on this top bow, I think it's called. Um, just to make sure that everything's smoothed off properly. I'm going to bevel that top. I always like beveling things, as I've talked about in most of the, you know, my courses and things like that. All right, so now we're coming to add in uh, some um, bolts on. Now, the thing is, I added this first bolt on, and then I saw it's going to be really uh, cumbersome just to um, add this going all the way around. You can see there that, you know, I'm trying to move it in and things like that. Now, we do have um, Blender's snap tools, but to be honest, with something like this, it's, it's pretty cumbersome still. So I'm like... All right, let's just take this into ZBrush and do it the easy way. First of all, I'm going to find uh, the brush with all the bolts and things like that. And I found it here, as you can see. This is it, IMM Model Kit. And then all you need to do is just drag drag out along that bow. And you've already got, um, you know, the mirror on. And there you go. Done. Simple as that. Really, really easy stuff. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that they're all sitting correct. And then I'm going to get rid of the backs of them. As you can see there, just uh, C with circle select all the way to the back, delete them off because I really don't need those backs. There's a lot of extra polygons for nothing really. All right, so now on to the actual uh, mast. So first of all, just pulled out a cylinder, gave it some edge loops, used their uh, proportional editing, shrunk the ends in, and then just beveled off the uh, edges of them. And there we go, pretty much done. Now I'm going to use that bomb mast actually to create the cloth. So you can see there, added some seams that makes it so that I can only uh, select islands, which is really nice. And then I'm just extruding it all the way up to where I need it to go. I can see straight away as well that the size uh, of this mast was a little bit small, so I just brought it up. Now, I did have the mast on the wrong way around, actually. Uh, you know, you can see the wind would be pushing back against it, making the boat go backwards. Uh, loop points that out actually so what I did was I went in and I spun that around I'm not sure if that's actually in this video but I do spin it around so it is actually going the right way as you can check on the uh, the image all right so now we're going to bring in our geometry node now I'm going to make sure that this geometry node, the rope geometry node is in this uh, pack so when you buy this pack uh, 299 it's really cheap um, it actually comes with this geometry node all set up for you so that any other projects that you use, you will have this rope available to you. So you can see there, the best thing about this geometry node, on the right hand side, you can see we can change the rope radius, the twist, the secondary rope radius, and the resolution. All really important things. So let's say you want something like vines, um, you know, on a, on a bridge or something. All you need to do is bring down that secondary rope radius and they'll actually start to look like um, vines and things. The other good thing is where that twist is, it means that as you'll see in a bit, we can make always make the rope actually fit together really nicely as though there's actually not any seams in it or anything like that. That's the other good thing. And finally then we've got the resolution on there. And what that means is because this rope is quite high poly, it means we can bring that polygon count down before we actually turn it into mesh. And that's also really important. Then all you need to do is you can go in, um, you can actually decimate it and bring it down a little bit more. 
You can see as well, when I pull that rope out, not only can we make circles, we can make paths, pull the rope out, and the rope will just extend as far as you pull it out. Wherever you move it as well, it's gonna keep its shape and everything like that. And it's just generally a really, really good geometry node. And what makes it even better is we, can, we don't actually have to work in the geometry node tab because we've got all of the options that we need to modify on the right hand side. Really, really nice. All right, so now I'm just working a little bit more on the actual sail, pulling it out, just making it look a little bit more like cloth. The thing is with the sail, it's gonna be really thick cloth anyway. It's got a lot of wind actually pushing against it and things like that. Now, if you're creating this boat as well, you don't have to do what I do in a bit, which is I made all of the holes in the sail and I did that because I feel it just adds that another level to the actual model. It just makes it look a lot better. So. Just fair warning, if, if you don't want to do this, you could probably get away with just using, um, you know, Substance Painter just to paint it without actually doing that. Because it is quite a tedious progress uh, process. You can see there, brought in um, a cylinder, and then I'm just going to bevel them off. Now, I did mess up because you can see the bottom of them is going to go straight through the cloth at the bottom. You can see that. And you'll see I'll come to that and I'm like, ah, oh, hey. And then I have to go in and fix that and... And it's all about knowing as well how to fix it, but you will see I do I do mess up. So this actually wasn't that big a build. It was uh, around maybe four to five hours, something like that, um, to do the whole process. I think that includes even the texturing, the rendering, everything like that. So actually quite a small build in comparison. You know, normally our builds are around the nine hour mark, something like that. So it's a nice project uh, for anybody I wouldn't say starting out, but really trying to, you know, take the work to that kind of next level. I would say this is actually a really, really nice project. It's, yes, it's using a few softwares, but you can do them in Blender. And there you go, you can see there the ones that I messed up. So I recommend, if you've got a good knowledge of Blender, and let's say you want to get into the sculpting part of Blender, then I think this actually would be a good project for you. All right, so I tried to fix those first of all um, with Alt F or with F and things like that and then triangulate, but in the end I just ended up adding a bridge and doing it that way so you can see here, just bridge them. I think actually I got rid, I didn't even bother with the one on the inside because no one's ever going to see that and there you go, you can see it worked out fine. I also tried decimating it and all kinds of things just to fix that. It took a few minutes to fix it, but you know. You can see now what I'm doing is I'm moving all of the rope into place, making sure it's all looking right. And then I'm going to go in and you can see there we're multi in that twist. All of the rope you can see, I just want to make sure they all go together. And because they're all separate pieces of rope as well, um, I want to make sure that they all line up perfectly and that's what I'm actually doing there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn them into mesh. And we can do that because um, we added a um, realize instances, I think it's called in the geometry node, which means that you can just literally go in um, up to object and, and uh, mesh to curve or, you know, uh, sorry, um, turn it into actual mesh instead of a curve. All right, so that's all the rope done. Join it all together. And now I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go in and decimate it a little bit because it's fairly, fairly high polygon. Now the thing is with rope, you can go in and use a substance painter. You can certainly texture rope and things like that. But on this, again, I wanted it to look a little bit higher. The other thing, of course, is you could go in as well and retopologize all that rope, you know, using a uh, curve and just going round it. That would be another way of doing it. But in the end, we just decided to leave it and you can see it looks uh, fairly realistic because we've done it that way. All right, so a simple shield here. And there is a little trick I use actually here. So you'll see, I'm going to grab those. It might be this one or the other shield. Yeah, you can see I just pulled those out. Now I'm going to use um, the loop tools. It's a free add-on built within Blender. You can see I'm going to bring them out, subdivide them, loop tools then, turn them to circles as you can see. And then all I'm going to do is bevel them off and put them back in. You can see really, really easy technique um, to actually uh, to do that. And that is the loop tools. It's got bridge and um, turning you know, squares into circles and things like that. Really, really handy tool. I mean, these shields, they took literally minutes to create basically down to that one um, tool. So it's about, you know, what you know to speed up your workflow. All right, so we're coming to the end of this part now. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to, um, you know, bring in some lighting, make sure my lighting looks good and things like that. 
Now we're onto the waves and what I've done is I've bought in a plane, I've used the ocean modifier, I'm going to play around with it a little bit just to get it something that I'm happy with and then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go in now within um, actual Blender and do a bit of sculpting in there. It's not like I don't know how to sculpt in Blender because ZBrush and Blender, they've got basically the same brushes and things and honestly once you have, you know, once you've been practicing sculpting, you can use any software for sculpting. They're pretty much all the same. So you just have a um, like a, a knack for sculpting and that's why you'll see, you know, some of the best people out there sculpting, they can basically sculpt anything uh, because they're so used to the tools, they're so used to visualizing things and all that kind of stuff. So if you do want to get good in sculpting, it's, it's down to practice. It's down to practice and referencing basically. It's not down to uh, the, the tool so much. I mean, I've seen people uh, create amazing models with like four or five brushes. That's all they use. No, no, none of the, uh, you know, the top sculptors, unless they're doing cloth or something like that, they're not using a hundred different brushes or anything. They've got a set amount of brushes and that's it. And that's basically what we also do in Blender as well. So, you know, you can try out all those brushes and that, and they, they have got, you know, they are useful in certain places, but for the main part, you're going to use three or four brushes. All right, so now I'm happy with the main part of the waves where they are. What I'm gonna do is then I'm just gonna create this uh, cylinder. I'm gonna use it as a Boolean just to get rid of the other waves. I don't really need them. I've also set that as well to fast because if you don't, sometimes it won't cut it away properly. All right, so now I'm coming in. I'm just gonna make sure everything's okay. I'm happy with the waves. I did try uh, solidifying them as you can see, but I could see that's not gonna work out. So I thought, you know what? I might as well just leave these as like a 2D plane because no one's gonna see like underneath it. I wasn't sure like before I did that, if I was gonna have an ocean, you know, um, and then bring it all the way down and be, basically be able to see into the sea or something, or if I was gonna, you know, put it in like, like I've got it here, actually sat in something. So final touches now, it's actually in there. Uh, just making sure that, you know, when you look at waves, they're very, they're actually quite sharp, you know, those uh, kind of riptides that come in. So that's what I'm doing now, just making sure they're okay and just adding the final bits onto it. And you can see now, I know already that once I've got, uh, you know, all of these kind of edges in there, that when, a, when a Luke gets this to actually uh, paint in Substance Painter, he's going to be used curvature, and that allows him then to put in all the details of these waves and things, because they're already there. They're actually, you know, built in with the, uh, with the sculpt that we've done. The only problem is that, you know, realistically, if you're doing something like this, you really want to actually create a, a high and low poly. Now, we, we do suffer where we don't have so much time, so we try and get things done, so we do cut out mainly that corner. So all you need to do is you need to just go in and retopologize this. Really, really easy to do, by the way, with something like Waves. You can basically just decimate it down or even Z um, remesh it or something like that down to a low amount and then smooth it off, and you can use that basically as your low poly then. No problem there. It's only when you've got something like, you know, with a lot of edges where you actually probably have to go in and re-topologize. All right, so I'm using my curves again. And this time it's just to make that ornamental piece, just to actually, you know, have a really, really beautiful plinth just to set it off. Now, the thing is I did bring it in um, with um, a even number of um, edges on the actual cylinder. But you can see it actually worked out fine because that front of it looks really, really nice actually. And there's the front, so I just twist it round now and you can see. Yeah, that looks pretty, pretty good. All right, so after this bit, I think we're on the end bit for the modeling section. And all I'm going to do is basically just set up some lighting um, just so I can see if everything's looking right. And normally I set it up and what I want to see basically is the shadows. Um, I'm not really interested in, um, you know, textures and things like that. I don't need to add materials or anything. I'm looking for the shadows. I'm looking for that detail and I'm also looking at the silhouette. So you can see here, this is the silhouette. And once I'm actually happy with the silhouette and how I'm going to take the main image, then I'm actually going to move on. And then it's over to Luke. So I'll see you after this, everyone. All right, welcome everyone to the texturing part of the video. My name is Luke and today I will be doing a commentary over the texturing part for the Viking boat. So in order for us to start off, I firstly went ahead and just started checking over how the textures look in regards to their UV unwraps. And in order for me to do that, I just made use out of the ambient occlusion. I generated the texture map for the AO and then I just went ahead and checked the entire mesh, how it looks like with that map on. 
And what I notice is that I'm having a couple of issues in regards to the planks on how they're baked, how the ambient occlusion is being baked. And I was trying to figure out why that is the case. Went to Blender and I couldn't find the solution. So I actually started just texturing and then I went ahead and just continued on with the rest of the baking mesh maps. And then afterwards I came back to fix it because I know that it's quite easy to replace the mesh within Substance Beta, but basically the issue was the reason I had some artifacts on the planks for the middle section of the boat was simply because during the UV unwrap part, I didn't unwrap the rings uh, for where the sail is being held in that area. So they were basically loose and they were overlaid on top of our material for the boat. So I had to go in back into the mesh and fix that. And then afterwards I go, I went into edit tab into project configuration and just use that to replace the mesh so after i was done with that i went ahead and started texturing process I started off with the shields and i was actually struggling in regards to the shields in regards to masking it because the entire mesh was just combined into one their vertices and everything was just one simple solid mesh a little bit of a trouble in regards to masking certain sections out especially near the borders of those shields because automatic UV unwrap was being used and some of the shells decided to, for the UVs, decided to just stay combined even though the angle was adjusted. But I don't know why that was the case. But in order to fix that, I just went back to Blender uh, real quick in the future and just marked the seams around the wooden parts and then kind of de detached the entire mesh for those shields. And then afterwards, I was able to UV unwrap the entire mesh again and then use uv chunk fill uh, for the mask to quickly mask out those areas and i went that made it so much easier in regards to the entire masking process but at this moment i was still uh, trying to mask out certain bits uh, manually i was trying to mask it out using polyfill where you basically mask out individual uh, polygons for each one of the faces and that was a more time consuming process but yeah i went back in and just fixed that afterwards and as for the materials for the shield wood, um, using one of the materials we created for the free pack. So if you're interested in it, you can check that out within one of our previous videos. And it's a really nice type of a wood pattern. But by default, for this type of particular mesh, I found it that it was not giving me enough of a normal detail. So what I ended up doing is just I ended up just copying the base of the material for the normal channel and just reapplying it afterwards again which basically just increased and amplified the entire intensity for this mesh or the texture. And yeah, afterwards I went ahead and just continued on the um, texturing process for the metal pieces as well. I'm also using one of the metal that was within that same pack, which gives a really nice type of a bump value for the edges. However, you need to know that in order to make the mesh look really nice and to kind of highlight those metal shapes, you also need to make use out of the edge wear out of the smart masks in order to get some additional color variation within that metal and just to make it look like it has some extra edge wear so the easiest way is just to make use out of the curvature mask and using that with a fill layer you're able to quickly make some adjustments to the edges and get some really nice and simple edge wear for it so yeah going back to the mesh i went ahead and quickly changed up with blender the mesh itself for those shields in order to get some bit of an easier way to mask out those edges which definitely did help out especially also for the middle parts as well since they're also coming out out of the middle section of the shield so they're not just simply placed on top of the shield they're actually part of that shield mesh so i also had to make use out of the mark seam in order to fix that up real quick and for some reason i was trying to figure out why the masking didn't quite work out as well when I was trying to select object uh, fill mode for the masking, but I ended up just using UV chunk fill for those mask selections. And that ended up being a quicker way anyway. And yeah, during this process, I also found out that those artifacts in the middle of the boat were caused by the bolts uh, for the sails. So I ended up quickly fixing that up. And then of course, as I said before, I just went back to the project configuration and uploaded a new mesh onto the substance painter which is really nice and quick way to switch up the meshes even if you have different brush strokes and whatnot it, the entire substance beta software remembers 
all the steps, all the history required to produce that type of a texture. So if you replace your material, even if it has different UV coordinates with that same exact type of a mesh, you'll basically be able to get the identical type of texturing that you had throughout the process. So right now, after I was done with the shields, um, I went ahead and continued on with the texturing process in regards to the boat. This time I went on to texture the frame itself and I wanted to try to get a really nice type of a grain, which was rather difficult because of those automatic UV unwrapped chunks. And basically because of it, there were some areas where it wouldn't have a nice flow and in order to overcome that i basically made use out of the triplanar projection which gave me a real nice result in regards to the consistency of a texture but that gave me another problem where the direction was much harder to control in for the frame itself so for starters i ended up just uh, using a very basic type of a grain direction and then i was trying to figure out what to do about the head because the head itself wouldn't look quite as well in regards to the grain as it has a lot of curve a lot of detail and that would just end up making it look uh, really noisy in regards to the overall texture so what i ended up doing is actually I ended up just getting myself a new fill layer with a mask and just overlaying on top of that head in order to cover up that wood grain so that is one way of uh, fixing that wood grain is just to hide it in certain areas where there's more complicated type of a mesh. And then afterwards, uh, once I was done with the head, I went on and quickly tried to fix the grain itself by simply duplicating the base material and then rotating the entire projection. And then afterwards, I just made sure to mask out the areas where I thought that the grain wasn't going in the right kind of direction which turned out quite all right but when doing that if you're using that same kind of a method you have to make sure that the normal and the height channels are actually set as normal type of overlays and by that i mean by default they're using a pass through or something of that in regards to the normal and height channels so basically they try to kind of blend in both values together and that only means that if we have wood grain underneath or texture it will kind of blend those two together and make it look uh, it won't make it look like wood it would just be too much of a noise type of a material too noisy even notice a proper type of a grain for our boat so in order for us to fix that all we gotta do is just make sure that we switch up channels within our layers tab to make sure that we are replacing those values and not just overlaying them on top of one another and uh, yeah afterwards uh, once i was happy with the framework of course we went in and continued on with the wood type of a texture i went ahead and added some additional detail for the base for the walkable area of the boat and i just made sure i had a dirt type of grunge for it i didn't want to use smart mask for this occasion because i wanted to have more control over those kind of smudges and whatnot so i ended up just manually painting that in and afterwards, once I was happy with that, I wanted to make sure I get myself a really nice type of a wood for the planks of the boat. It was rather difficult because the boat itself is curved and I was using automatic UV unwrap. So that just meant I had to put extra thought into blending in the grain of the wood when I was using triplanar projection. And afterwards, once I was happy with that, I went in and quickly made myself a platform for the boat just to make sure I get myself a nicer type of idea on how the boat is going to be presented. And I got myself some nice golden ornament for the side just to kind of highlight the overall platform. And actually I was considering about uh, getting some gold ornament for the boat itself, but I figured that it will look much nicer in regards to keeping the head and whatnot of the boat as wood engravings. I did add uh, some metal pieces for the horns of the front of the boat that made it look super nice i think i kept it i guess it just highlights a little bit of that extra shape without taking our attention too much away from the boat itself and afterwards i then continued on the detection process in regards to the rope and got myself a real nice type of a smart material for it which lets me have uh, two variations of a rope with some really nice basic type of a fabric material on it and uh, it just allows us to kind of get some color variation between those intertwining ropes and I also I think I used some curvature mask in order to highlight the edges of the rope a little bit as well just to kind of get a nicer shape out of the mesh for the ropes itself then afterwards I continued on the texture process I made sure that the sails are looking quite nice especially the pole I made sure to use some log 
alphas that I had and just applied it on top of the sail uh, pole and the sides of it as well and that just gave me a real nice type of a look for that type of aged wood. Then, of course, once I was done with the pole itself, I had to continue on in regards to the fabric. I was playing around a little bit with it. I was making use out of a material for a dungeon prop pack that we created previously, and it turned out quite all right. But by default, I wanted to make sure I get myself a nicer, lighter type of a color. And so I had to make sure I adjust the color, the color coordinations and the fill layers accordingly in regards to that. Otherwise, it wouldn't look quite as nice. For example, I have some crease mask overlays that if I were to just keep it as is, it would make the entire fabric look somewhat glossy. And we, of course, don't want this to happen. So I had to adjust all the values. And I also added some stripes just to get a nicer pattern for the entire sail. So yeah, once I was happy with that, I continued on and started texturing the ocean itself. It's rather easy to work with a solid type of a water, especially when it's still because all we gotta do is just make sure we get some metallic type of a material as a solid color as the base. And then afterwards, we just need to apply another color information that makes use out of a thickness generated texture map. that kind of lightens up the areas in between the shape of that water. Usually you'd think that the thicker the areas are, the darker the water would be. But if you get a real nice type of a lighting from this coming from the sun, for example, you'd get some real nice refractions and in order to make it a little bit more stylized I actually made those thicker areas even brighter actually which overall I think turned out really well and then to finish it off of course we added some foam at the top of our water I made use out of the generated position mask as well and in order to kind of mask out the bottom uh, of the foam just to make sure that that bottom of the water doesn't have the same amount of foam as the top sections of the water for the ocean which overall turned out all right and I was continuing on with in regards to making sure that I had some extra detail for the boat as well so for example for the outside bit for the outside section of the wood I made sure to add a little bit of a moss and a little bit of a wet shiny type of a look for the material just to make sure that I separate the outside from the inside for that texture which overall turned out quite all right and I realized then that the shields didn't look quite as well just by having a plain type of a wood. I had to make sure I break off the overall color, so I ended up making use out of another fill layer just to kind of get some nicer colors for those shields. At first, I tried making use out of a variation of solid colors, and that just made it look like the boat is kind of a circus type of a boat. I didn't quite like that result. So I ended up making use out of a one solid color and afterwards I ended up making use out of some ornaments to just kind of stamp out some additional details just to kind of make uh, make it fit a little bit more with the overall setting. By default, uh, Substance Painter does have some nice Celtic stamps uh, for the alphas uh, to use, which are quite nice to make use out of. So by just stamping them out, it turned out quite all right. And yeah, I continued on by making some 12 small tweaks and adjustments for the rest of the parts like uh, making sure that the grain for the wood is set up properly so I made sure that the projections are applied nicely to it I do have a bit of an issue at the moment in regards to how the front decoration uh, for the side of that wood is being curved but I'm going to use another technique real quick to fix that in a bit I also added some additional fabric detail to make sure it fits nicely in regards to how the tension is being applied to the overall sail. Then I realized that I'll, I might as well play around a little bit with the crease detail for this section. And I just played around with the color values just to make sure it stands out. Uh, the overall fabric just stands out a little bit more. And I think it turned out quite all right. So yeah, in order to highlight uh, some of that detail, especially for the areas where the wood and metal interacts, I also made sure to set my crease mask uh, to use a cavity mode which kind of allowed me to highlight those areas. It's really helpful to use those cavity masks in order to get some additional detail for where the dirt would be collecting, for example, and to kind of better highlight the overall shape. And yeah, afterwards, I also ended up just painting out a little bit for the front of the head for this Viking ship, a little bit for the eyes and the teeth. I also experimented for the other areas as well, but I wanted to make sure I keep the paint to minimal. I ended up just painting it out manually using artistic brush on within substance painter which turned out really nicely then again i went back and uh, started tweaking out some smaller areas some smaller details just to make sure that everything fits in really nicely together with all the textures and all the detail i started going in to uh, 
checking out how the overall grain looks for the side of the boat for the front section and this time because it has such a awkward curve i couldn't just make use out of the triplanar projection so i actually made use out of a same material and i just painted out i stamped out the detail manually for where the grain would be going and that turned out so much better in regards to that so small detail like that is usually overlooked when texturing but doing such detail is usually what makes the overall model look more believable more in depth and whatnot and yeah afterwards i just had to make sure that i go in and out a little bit just to make sure i don't get too much of a tunnel vision and just adjust each one of the details to kind of fit in the overall image again i'm going back to the grain just making sure that it kind of gives us a real nice type of a curve throughout the entire boat I think by just switching two triplaners, having one 90 degrees rotation and another one going in a different way didn't quite work out as much. So I actually, for the front and the back, I had even a couple of extra materials that kind of overlaid those areas, which turned out all right. And yeah, just getting some final touches, making sure that the overall curve for the back of the grain is set up nicely as well. Although it's not quite as visible because just like for the head, I just made sure to kind of hide away some of that detail even though if it's not as complicated as the front i just want to make sure that the consistency goes throughout the entire boat and if i only had it for the front section where the grain would be hiding it wouldn't look quite as well the back for example wouldn't look quite as worn out so yeah just making sure that the consistency is set throughout the entire boat then afterwards once i was happy with the entire texturing process all i had to do is just make sure i export everything out I'm exporting all of it out as 4K textures, which is super easy to do in Substance Beta. It automatically upscales every single texture, even though I started the texturing process as 2048 resolution, just to make sure that the performance doesn't slow down my creative workflow. So yeah, with that said and done, all that was left to do was basically set up the environment within Blender. So here we are back in Blender, and the first thing I'm going to do is add in all those beautiful textures that Luke created. And you can see, as soon as we add those in, it just brings it to life straight away. We've even got it on material mode, and now I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on my cycles. I did have it on EV, but now I'm going to put it on cycles. Just check out and make sure that, you know, all of the shading's correct and things like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to bring in some lighting, just to see if I can make it look any better. Um, you know, because Cycles does a good job straight off the bat. You can bring a sun in with Cycles and it, and it still looks good. You, um, so the other thing is as well is I want to mess around with this background. I want to make sure that the, the lighting um, on the background is good as well because that does affect how it will look overall. So you can see now, bringing in all that lighting, making it this kind of blue hue because obviously you've got a light, a lot of light bouncing off the sea and things like that i bought in that plane as well to see to try and get some light bouncing you know back downwards and then back upwards and it wasn't working out so i got rid of the plane in the end and now the problem i've got is the water you can see that the uh, the water on the back there it's like bright at the front but we've got too many dark shadows at the back so i actually want to go in and fix that so what i did in the end was um i brought a plane and put it over the top now the other thing I'm doing with the water is I'm just going to mess around with it, give it a little bit of transparency, and then also um, bring down the uh, roughness and the metallic. And the way I'm doing that is by using RGB curves. Best way to do it, if you've got any map that you bring in and you're not happy with it, bring in RGB curves first and then you can see if that will fix it. Now you can see I brought in a light from the top as well, getting rid of those drastic shadows at the bottom. And now I'm going to go for my first actual uh, render, turn it down to something like 50 or something like that. And then all you want to do is you can go then to your composite. So I'm going to go to my composite. First of all, I'm going to add a diamond sharp, get all that sharpness in. Then I'm going to add a glare just to get some really nice gleams off of those shields and any metalwork and things like that. And finally, then I'm going to bring in an RGB curves. This is going to be allowing me to uh, play around with the... Uh, you know, the color and things like that. The hue and saturation to bring out all of those beautiful textures and things. And finally then just a color balance to balance everything out. Then normally the setup that I use every single time. And with that setup, I think even when I take into Photoshop nowadays, honestly, I barely have to do anything. It just makes it so, so easy. All right, so now that is a 50 or 100, something like that on samples. So basically it's another render and I've actually, uh, 
you know, put it on a mid render. And the reason I do that is because then I get, can get rid of any kind of fixes that I need to do and things like that. And finally then, this is the actual final render. And as you can see, it looks really, really nice. Um, and then finally what I do is, I mean, really at that stage, once you've done that final render, because it, you know, it's gonna take half an hour, 45 minutes on my computer, I make sure that before I do that one, everything is done properly, everything I'm happy with before I do anything, you know, like a final render. So that's why I always do a low, a mid, and a final render. And the low and the mid, they're actually quite close together. The low is like, you know, 50 samples or something. The mid for me is like 500 samples. And finally, we've got the end uh, render, which is around 5,000 samples with denoising on, of course. All right, everyone. So that is how we put together this stylized Viking boat. I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope you got a lot out of it because this was a little bit different from what we normally do. And if you want to actually get your hands on this blend file or anything like that, check out the links down below. If you want to get it for free along with all the courses, as we told you in the beginning, please join us on Patreon or actually check out our site on Patreon to see exactly what we've got to offer. And I'll see you on the next one, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.